Hello everyone. Welcome to lecture 27. So we're entering the closing stretch here. Today's lecture is going to be closing up on waves. And then finally, lecture 28, we'll talk about a specific type of wave, sound wave, and that'll be it. So today is a quick reminder, we're going to keep going with waves. So what we talked about last time was the basic idea of waves. The thing to remember is that waves are not the movement of some objects, not the movement of like a string or students in class, but disturbances on a medium. So you have a string that's at equilibrium, it would be flat, and then you pluck it a little, and a little disturbance moves along that string. So that is a wave. And a transverse wave is a special kind, like a wave on a string, where the points themselves, each object is going to move up and down, so vertically, while the wave moves horizontally, or vice versa. So they move perpendicular to one another. So we can describe that by a wave function. So for example, y equals a cosine kx minus omega t is a right mover. a cosine kx minus plus omega t is a left mover. So that sign difference tells us which direction is moving. And then finally, at the end of class, we learn that the waves will transmit power in the direction of motion, which for the special case of a string, we learn this formula for the average power. Alrighty, so today we're going to pick up by asking what happens when a wave hits a boundary. And in particular, let's imagine what's called a fixed boundary. I simply tie that string to a wall or something so that that point at the end can't move. Alright, so let's see what happens when that wave hits the boundary. Most oh, homeowners guess, insurance providers can give you a quote online. Add, there we go. I do not endorse lemonade. Um, so here's an example of a fixed boundary condition. What we have is a case where at the top there, the, um, the spring's being held fixed. And I want you to take a quick look at what happens when this guy sends a pulse along the wave. So you see, it inverts. When it reflects, it comes back upside down. Okay, so next we're gonna have a loose end. We'll do that in a quick second. So that was a case of a fixed end. The end point is held fixed. And what basically happened is that when the string gets there, the wall has to push it backwards. It has to push back on it. So it pushes that wave down and the wave goes upside down. So if my incoming wave in both of these cases is y is equal to, oops, sorry about that a cosine kx minus omega t, so positive amplitude, and it's moving to the right, so that's a negative sign. The reflected wave has a negative sign out front telling us that it's going upside down, so the y values are negative, and uh, it has a plus sign here telling us it's moving to the left. All right, so that's a reflected wave when the wall holds the string in place. It's worth noting that when I hold a point in place, that's what's called a node. It's a position where the string doesn't move at all. All right, so now what's gonna happen if instead I have a loose end to my string? Let's go back to our YouTube video here. So here's a case where you have the um, slinky or whatever tied to just a piece of string. So that piece of string is free to move but it's gonna reflect some of the wave as you'll see. The question is, what does the reflected wave look like? So notice when it just hits that spring, it reflects in the same direction it came in. So I'm gonna to try to get one reflection right. Nope, that's the fixed boundary. You saw it inverted. So this is the fixed boundary again that they're showing. And here is a way too zoomed in version of that. Here's the loose end. Okay, so then slow motion, the loose end, it hits right there and it reflects back upright. So if I have a perfect fixed end, I reflect upside down. If I have a perfectly loose end, I reflect right side up, meaning the reflected has positive A amplitude, so it's in the same direction as the incoming wave, but now it's traveling to the right, so that's Kx plus omega t. 
Okie dokie. So this is what's called the boundary condition on the wave. There are these two options, either it's a fixed boundary condition or a loose boundary condition, and that controls whether it reflects upside down or right side up. Now that's going to be really important when we start to consider many things happening at the same time. So this goes under the name superposition and interference. The idea is basically as follows. Imagine I have two separate waves that are both solutions to the wave equation. Okay? So we know that y1 satisfies this equation, d squared y1 dt squared is equal to v squared d squared y1 dx squared. That's the wave equation. And similarly for y2. The question is, what can we say about their sum, y1 plus y2? So it's not too bad. We're just going to do a couple of lines of algebra here. So if we take d squared dt squared, the second derivative with respect to time of y1 plus y2, we can just factorize that into two terms. So distribute into two terms, I should say. Each of those satisfies the wave equation, so we'll go ahead and plug that in. And there's this common factor v squared. And what you see is that the sum y1 plus y2 satisfies the same wave equation as y1 or y2 separately. So that's the principle of superposition. If we have two or more waves that are individually solutions to the wave equation, we can add them together and get a separate solution to the wave equation. So we're going to see that in the case of boundaries, this is going to have a really important effect. Let's start off by forgetting about boundaries and just imagine we have two wave pulses. So for example, I could have this wave pulse, which is upward and moving to the right, this wave pulse, which is upward and moving to the left. So if I want to see what happens in this case, all I'm going to do is I'm going to simply follow them together. Okay, so this leftmost one will just move a little bit to the left. The rightmost one is going to move a little to the right, I, and so on, and so on. And if I want to know the whole wave, so my whole wave function is just the sum of the two wave functions. That's still a solution to the wave equation. So what all I need to do is track each one of these guys independently. y1 is, let's say, the left mover. y2 is the right mover. Figure out what it's doing, and then add them up, and I get the net wave. So this yellow line right here is the string itself. All right, so the whole wave, you can just add up each of the ones individually. So this is kind of cool. A really nice example of this is if I release a rubber band like so. Okay, so at time t equals zero, the rubber band makes a triangle like this. And then I'm going to propagate it forward in time. This is basically a wave. So if we go back to our PowerPoint, you see that right in the middle, when I have this left mover and this right mover come right on top of each other, they add up together to form a triangle. If I let that continue forward in time, they're going to kind of start to separate. So if after a little bit of time, it's going to look like this, a flat top. After a little longer, that top will distort in the middle, and eventually they'll just move moving separately. So that's actually what's happening with this released rubber band. I start out with everything up top, and then I release it. And you see this flat top propagates like so. Two triangles added together. If I have triangle 1 plus triangle 2, I add them together, what I get is a line, a flat top, and then another line. So that's what's going on with that rubber band example. Now the rubber band example is a little bit more confusing because of these boundary conditions here. It can't really move. But it illustrates the general principle of superposition. So if you have two solutions to the wave equation, I can just add them together I get another solution to the wave equation. Now what I want you guys to think a little bit about is what happens if I have two waves, one of which is positive and one of which is negative, moving in the directions that are shown on this slide. So can you draw for me as a function of time, 
what are these guys going to look like? What is the total wave going to look like? All right, so let's do this together. So t equals 0, let's say. It just looks like an upward triangle moving to the right plus a downward triangle moving to the left. They add up together, I just get that combined wave as was drawn on the previous slide. So that's pretty boring. What about at the point where, let's say, the peak of this guy just hits the front of that guy. So this guy moves a little to the right, this guy moves a little to the left until they line up like that. So let's draw that. Let's call that, I don't know, some later time. So here, this top one would have moved a little to the right. The bottom one would have moved a little bit to the left. And what I've told you is that the peak just hits the bottom here. So this is going to look a little something like this. And the sum of these two, so if this guy's y1, this guy's y2, the sum of these guys, y1 plus y2, is going to look as follows. So it's 0 for a little while, because both of them are 0. Then you start to do the first triangle. Up until a certain point, right here, where you start to see the downward slope of the other triangle. Notice it's a downward slope here, plus a downward slope here. So it's actually a double downward slope. And then finally, I see the upward slope on the other side. So at this point in time, the wave function looks a little something like this. Now here's a really fun point. If I continue along, eventually those two waves are going to completely overlap. So I'll have a positive triangle plus a negative triangle. I add up those waves, what do I get? I get a wave function equal to 0. Because everywhere y1 is equal to negative y2, I add them up and I get 0. So the question is, if my wave function at this particular point in time is 0, does that mean that I stop forever? The answer is no. So we know this guy is just going to keep moving to the right. It's just going to pass right through this wave as if they're not talking to each other. And after some amount of time later, the top guy will move to the right. The bottom guy will have moved to the left. And when I add them together, I'm going to get something that's definitively not zero. So that's kind of fun property of these waves. At certain points in time, it can look like nothing's happening. It can look like the wave function's completely gone. But if you're a little bit more careful, what you'll find is the velocity is not zero at this time. These points are moving as the waves move. And therefore, they continue to move along, and eventually you end up with um, the waves separated again. OK, so this is the principle of superposition and interference. I can always add up two solutions to the waves. I can solve each of these waves separately, add them together, and I get a final result, which is also my wave function, which is my whole wave function. You can see that I can get a certain type of interference called destructive interference, where it just completely cancels at a particular point in time. But that doesn't mean the string stops moving. That just means that at a particular snapshot in time, the wave function is zero. All right, so now let's put a little bit of math behind this. I want you to practice by putting these objects together. Imagine I have a string over here, and I'm going to continuously shake that guy up and down to create a right-moving traveling wave, a cosine kx minus omega t. At x equals 0, it encounters a wall and then reflects back. And the wall is going to give this closed boundary condition, this fixed boundary condition, so it's going to reflect back upside down. So what I want you to try to do is combine these principles of superposition and boundary conditions to figure out what is the combined wave function 
of the right moving wave and its reflection. So try to write down the reflection first, then figure out the combined wave. What's the maximum velocity of a given point on the string? And how much power is transmitted past a given point x? Does it move left or right? All right, so I'll assume everyone's had a chance to try this problem. This is a very nice example, which we're going to kind of keep coming back to throughout this uh, class of superposition. So let's go ahead and make sure we're completely on the same page as to what's going on. We have two waves added together. I have a right moving wave, which I will call y right. So it's going to look like a traveling wave moving to the right with some velocity v. And we said that y right is a cosine kx minus omega t. And at x equals 0, it's going to hit a wall causing a reflection. So the reflection is going to move to the left. I will call that y left. It looks like whatever it looks like. We'll figure that out in a second. So here's the wall. And so the first thing to do is to figure out what does y left look like. So we just discussed that. We discussed that y left is negative a cosine kx plus omega t. As a reminder, this negative sign tells me that it reflects upside down. And this positive time tells me that it's moving to the left instead of to the right. So I have a right moving wave plus its reflection, which is a left moving wave. And now the next question is, what is the total wave function? So that's where we have to apply this principle of superposition. The total wave function y is just the left mover plus the right mover. In other words, a cosine kx minus omega t plus negative a cosine kx plus omega t. And that, my friends, is everything. This is completely correct answer for the wave function. But we should try to do this um, a little bit more carefully. So the first thing to check, what I told you is that at x equals 0, the wall, so there's a wall, which means that y has to be 0. At that particular point, it can't move up, it can't move down, it's held fixed at y equals 0. So it turns out the solution I just wrote down has this property. y of x equals 0. When I plug that into this equation, I get a cosine of negative omega t minus a cosine of omega t. But notice that cosine of negative omega t is the same as cosine of positive omega t. Cosine is an even function. And therefore, this is 0, as promised. That's actually kind of not guaranteed for us. We just got a little bit lucky. If I wanted to be a little bit more careful, what I would have had to do is I would have had to add some arbitrary phase here, and we'd have to solve for the phase. It just so happens that we picked a really nice boundary condition, and that phase is equal to 0. So for this class, we tend to pick pretty easy boundary conditions. But in, in practice, all you know is that the amplitude is negative, it's upside down, and that it's cosine of kx minus omega, uh, plus omega t. So you really don't know that phase up front. Anyways, we've checked this works, and indeed it's correct. The next thing we're going to do, because it's going to save us some time later, is we're going to do a little bit of algebra. Okay? So I've told you the total wave function is y is equal to a cosine kx minus omega t minus a cosine kx plus omega t. And we're going to use uh, some trig identities. So cosine of kx minus omega t, I can write that as a times cosine, cosine, plus sine, sine.
and similarly for the other guy. So that's minus a times cosine, cosine, minus sine, sine, And we get this really nice cancellation, a cosine cosine minus a cosine cosine cancels out. And our final result for the wave function is simply 2a sine kx sine omega t. So when I add these two waves together, I get the following wave function, which notice no longer looks like a traveling wave. I told you that traveling waves have the form cosine kx minus omega t. This absolutely does not have that form. So we're going to talk a lot more about this. This is a variant of what's called the standing wave. For now, that's just our wave function. So let's go ahead and proceed a little bit further using that as our wave function. So the next step is to figure out what's the maximum velocity of a given point x on the spring, on the string. So here, we'll go and calculate velocity. As you have done on the homework, the velocity is the derivative of y with respect to time. Partial derivative because I'm keeping x fixed. So this is pretty straightforward for this wave function. I just have to take the derivative of the sine, and I get 2a omega from the derivative of omega t times sine kx times cosine omega t. So that's at any given point in time, x and t. That's my velocity. The max velocity is when cosine is either plus or minus 1 and it's equal to 2a omega times the magnitude of sine k times x. So I want you to notice something here. This says that if sine of k times x is 0, the velocity is 0. In other words, that point doesn't move. So that's actually true. In fact, if you go back to the wave function, if sine of kx were 0, y is also 0 at these points. So those are again what I called nodes. And we'll keep coming back to this. One obvious example of this is x equals 0. The wall is a node. But also what you'll find is there are other nodes along the string. All of the points where sine kx is equal to 0, they don't move, their velocity is 0, their position is 0, and they will be nodes. So we'll come back to that. But that's an important property. So previously for traveling waves, vy max was just a omega. Now your velocity depends on position. Secondly, I mean, finally, how much power is transmitted past the point x? So here, I guess there's no easy way to do this in the context of um, online classes. Normally, I would do a fun little poll here and try to trick you guys, but I can't do it here. So um, what would you think is the trick answer? Well, the trick answer, which turns out to be correct, is that the power is 0. Why is that? Well, again, it's the superposition principle. The total power, let's say average power, is that of the left moving wave minus that of the right moving wave, plus that of the right moving wave. But power is transmitted in a given direction. I should say this a little bit differently. The average power going to the right is that of the right moving wave, so 1 half square root of mu f omega squared a squared to the right. The average power of the left moving wave is going to transmit a power of 1 half root mu f omega squared a squared to the left. 
But if I transmit 10 watts this way plus 10 watts that way, what do I get? Nothing. There's no net transport. So when I add these two waves together, I get no average power. Again, we will come back to this in a couple of slides here. All right, so as I've alluded to, this is a very nice example because it's what's called a standing wave. So far, all we've done is we've held one of the ends fixed, and we've asked what happens as a wave reflects off that boundary. Now imagine the following situation. I hold both ends fixed. So I start out with a traveling wave. It's moving to the right. It hits the right wall. It reflects upside down and comes backwards. That hits this wall. That reflects right side up and keeps going again and again and again in this loop. And if you solve the wave equation under the constraints that y equals zero at both of these two ends, the results you get out are these standing waves. The wave function is exactly what I had just drawn. y is equal to 2a sine kx sine omega t. And when I plot that out, it looks a little something like this. Okay? So sine kx sine omega t. Here's what happens at t equals zero, sine kx. And then at a later time t, for example, when sine omega t is negative one, it would look like this. In between, it's gonna go back and forth between these two extrema. And the result looks a little something like what's shown in this video. So I'm gonna try to show a video of this. It's These called mode, M-O-D-E, one. Standing waves on a slinky. So here we go. This was the first standing wave right here. Um, lowest see frequency is standing wave hands, pattern is this one. Node. It's y called mode, M-O-D-E, one. And in between, the slinky is going to oscillate the first up and harmonic. down. Or like the first harmonic. Or in other words, oscillate. also called so the, the fundamental period, it's mode. Up and down it's and the up lowest and down and frequency up. mode that you can get in a tra If I average over many of those, it looks a little something like this. Okay? So in this video, they do a pretty good job of getting what's called the next transverse harmonic. standing so we'll talk wave. About this in a quick second. If I what double the frequency they can try to go a little faster of that mode. There we go. I get the second harmonic, or second mode, you see and sometimes called the first and there's actually a overtone. Right in the middle, kind of right where the and this one, if you'll notice, is going twice as fast. So again, and if I average over many oscillations, this looks a little something like this. There's a node at one end, there's a node at the other end, and there's a node in the middle. So that's the second harmonic. I can create two nodes in the middle, third harmonic, three nodes in the middle, fourth harmonic, and so on. You see that there are many solutions that have the form y of x t is equal to 2a sine kx sine omega t. So those are called standing waves. Now quickly, before we move on, I want to point out a couple of features of the standing waves that you should be aware of. One, as I mentioned a few times, are the nodes. Nodes are points that do not move. So the ends will always be nodes. And then for this particular one, this point in the middle is a node. Antinodes are the opposite of nodes. They're the points where the amplitude is largest, the maxima of that sine kx. So that's right here. This point is going to, max, is going to oscillate a very large amount over the course of the cycle. So where that's the largest amount, that's called an antinode of the standing wave. So the things to remember about standing waves, first off, as we just saw, standing waves are a superposition, a sum of a left moving wave and a right moving wave, specifically a left moving traveling wave and a right moving traveling wave. Okay, so that's how we got them out in that example. What that means, by the way, is that if I just let go of my hands, so I get rid of these nodes right here, let them go and release them into a whole string, what I'm gonna get 
is I'm going to get a left moving wave plus a right moving wave. Okay? So those two together add up to give a standing wave. If I let go of the nodes, I just get the sum of the original two waves. However, if I don't let go of them, I have what's called a standing wave pattern. And the big thing to remember is that standing waves, they stand there, they don't move. So they're kind of sitting there fixed, oscillating up and down as we've seen. We can reinterpret this in the language of interference. So we've talked a little bit about constructive interference when these two triangles add up together to give a bigger triangle. That's what's happening at these antinodes. I get constructive interference, they add together to get a larger wave, the right and the left movers. Destructive interference, when my up plus down gave me zero, that's what's happening at my nodes. They destructively interfere to give me zeros of my wave function. And finally, as I mentioned, standing waves do not transport energy because the energy that moves to the left will exactly cancel out the energy that moves to the right. All right, so that's the basics of standing waves. Again, putting a little math on that, we've seen that the wave function is y is equal to 2a sine kx sine omega t. A little bit of notation, sometimes we'll call this 2A, ASW for standing wave, so ASW, and that just makes it look a little prettier, so as A standing wave times sine KX, sine omega T. That is the wave function of a standing wave with one of the nodes at X equals zero. If for whatever reason I choose not to have a node at x equals zero, then I have to be a little bit more careful. But as it's drawn, I'm okay. All right. So if I now talk about these nodes and these antinodes, it's pretty clear what this means mathematically. So sine omega t is causing my overall wave to go up and down as a function of time. And my overall wave looks like amplitude standing wave ASW times sine kx. So when sine kx is equal to zero, the wave function is zero. That's my nodes. When sine kx is maximal, so plus or minus one, those are my antinodes. So the question that I want you to answer now for me is we know that for these boundary conditions, I need nodes at x equals zero and at x equals the other wall. Let's call that x equals to L. So what does that mean for k? What values of k satisfy nodes at x equals 0 and x equals L? I want you to go ahead and take a couple seconds, see if you can solve this yourself. All right. So we need to have the following property. We need to have nodes at x equals 0 and x equals L for this particular standing wave where I've held those two points fixed. Mathematically, that means that sine of k times x is equal to 0 for x equals 0 and x equals L. So x equals 0 is trivial. That doesn't really do anything because sine of 0 is 0. The x equals L is going to matter. So I need sine of k times L is equal to 0. So what phases here are going to give me sine equal to 0? The answer is k times L is a multiple of pi. So n here is an integer, meaning that k times l can be 0, as we've already seen, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on. It could also be negative, but that won't really matter. So k equals 0 means nothing, because then I just have sine of 0. That's just like the wave function is 0. Pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, these all mean something. 
And if I solve them for k, I would get k is equal to one second n pi divided by l or if I start writing out the first few I have pi divided by l 2 pi divided by l 3 pi divided by l and so on so here n is a positive integer So these are what are called the modes, the solutions to the standing wave equation. And I can do a little bit more math. So k is pi n divided by l is the easiest one to derive, but I can go a little further. So if k sub n, I'll put that subscript n to tell me which mode it is, so that's n pi divided by l. I can quickly figure out the wavelength lambda. So the wavelength, remember, is by definition 2 pi divided by k. If I insert this value of k, that's 2 pi divided by n pi over l. The pi's cancel, and I get 2l divided by n. Similarly, my frequency of the modes, the frequency with which it oscillates, is um, V over lambda. So again, you may remember that frequency is V over lambda for any wave, traveling wave or otherwise, where V is the velocity of traveling waves in the string. So that's simply v over 2l over n, or nv over 2l. Those are the other equations that I have on this slide. Okay? So once I know the possible wave vectors k, I can solve for the possible wavelengths lambda or the possible frequencies f. And these are what are called normal modes. So normal doesn't really have much relevance here, but it, it goes along for the ride. Mode is the term you will hear a lot. They basically tell me what are the options for standing waves on a string. So n equals 1. I go back a few. Is this guy. It's that really long wavelength mode that oscillates up and down very slowly. N equals 2 is this guy. Has one node in the middle. Oscillates a little faster. N equals 3 is this one with two nodes in the middle. N equals 4 is this one with three nodes in the middle. You can just see that from the math because I know it's sine of k times x is that overall wave function. Sorry. There we go. So those are the normal modes. And the thing to remember is that each normal mode has its own wavelength. So here, if I look at this wave, the wavelength of this guy, for example, this is lambda 2, is just L, right? Does one wavelength over the entire wave, right, over the entire length, L. And if we go into our equation, yes, indeed, lambda 2 should be L. Lambda 3 is 2L over 3, and so on. So each wavelength has its own wavelength. Each normal mode has its own wavelength, and it has its own frequency. So it's going to oscillate up and down at a certain frequency, which go by special names. So F1, the lowest frequency, is what's often called the fundamental frequency. F2 is called the first overtone. F3 is called the second overtone, and so on. And that's not so important for physics. It's just a little terminology. For those of you who do music, you'll see that those are actually very useful um, things to know. So let's get a little practice with this. Imagine I create a standing wave in a string with length 0.3 meters and both hands held fixed. The mass of the string is 0.005 kilograms. So if I tell you the fundamental frequency is 500 hertz, what I want you to tell me is what is the velocity of traveling waves on the string? What is the tension in the string? 
And what are the wavelength and frequency of that second harmonic, n equals 2? All right. So let's go ahead and do this one together. Or hopefully you've you know, taken a shot to do this on your own. Let's start with that um, fundamental harmonic. OK, so what do we know? We have a standing wave on a string. Standing wave on a string. We know that the um, length of the string, 0 0.3 meters. We know that the mass is 0 0.005 kilograms. We know that the fundamental frequency, F1, is 500 hertz. Part A asks us what's the velocity of traveling waves on the string. So let's go to our equations. The nth harmonic, one second here, here we go. So the nth harmonic has a frequency, as we've seen, nv over 2l. Sorry, my computer's being a little slow here. Let's give it a second. There it goes. So for n equals 1, that means f1 is equal to v over 2 times l. So here we know everything except for v. We can go ahead and solve for that. Velocity of waves on the string is 2 times l times that fundamental frequency. So I go ahead and plug in some numbers. I have um, 2 times 0 0.3 times 500 hertz. The velocity of waves on that string is 300 meters per second. Part B, what is the tension in the string? So the velocity of waves in a string is simply the square root of tension divided by mass per unit length, mu. Okay? So here I want to solve for tension. I'm going to square both sides. I have tension is equal to mass per unit length times velocity squared. So that's the mass times the velocity squared divided by the length. And let's go ahead and plug in some numbers. So the mass is 0 0.005 times the velocity is 300 meters per second squared over that length, which is 0 0.3, I get a tension of 1,500 newtons. Okay, good so far. And finally, what are the wavelength and frequency of the second harmonic, i.e. the first overtone, n equals 2? Okay, so we'll actually start out with frequency. That's a little easier. So F2 is simply, well, nV over 2L. That's 2V over 2L. Notice that's simply 2 times F1. So this is an important property. Fn, the nth harmonic, is just n times the fundamental frequency. So if I want the second harmonic, I double the fundamental frequency. I get 1,000 hertz which for those of you in the music community, this is known as the octave. The first harmonic will always be one octave higher, one multiple of two higher. We'll come back to that, I think, on a future slide. All right, so that's my second harmonic. It's at 1,000 hertz. What's the wavelength? Lambda 2. Well, lambda 2 is 2L over N. Lambda n is 2L over n, n is equal to 2. And we see that the wavelength is simply the length of the string, which in this case is 0 0.3 meters. Okay? So all of this simply comes from plotting out what's going on here. So if we draw this out, that first harmonic, the fundamental frequency, what was happening is I had those ends held fixed, and I had the function my wave function, y is equal to a sine of k times x. The fundamental harmonic has k equal to pi over l. 
this is a standing wave, I should be a little careful, times sine of omega t. And what's happening is the entire string, this function right here, a standing wave sine pi x over l, which you can confirm looks like this, is going to simply go up and down as sine of omega t. So it'll start out looking like this after time period over 2. This is going to become negative 1, so I'll fluctuate to down here, and then it's going to go all of the space in between. So it's going to kind of oscillate back and forth like so, which is what we had pictures of earlier. The second harmonic goes twice as fast, and it looks like this. So there's what t equals 0 looks like, excuse me, at t equals capital T over 2. I fluctuated down, and in between I'm simply going to fill in the space here. So it's going to kind of look up and down like this. Okay? So those are my first couple of harmonics here. Alrighty. So there's a lot of very good examples of this. This actually was a pretty good example of something like a guitar string or a violin string. So string instruments are examples of standing waves where I hold them fixed at both ends. So they have this boundary condition that we just talked about. And we actually know a lot about this. So for example, how do you tune the um, frequency of a stringed instrument? Well, you know that. You vary the tension in the string, right? You have these little tensioning rods at the end. You torque them a little bit. It changes the tension in that string, and therefore it changes the pitch. Because frequency of the nth harmonic is nv over 2l, but v is simply square root of tension divided by mu. Okay, so if I change my tension, I change my frequency. Secondly, if I want to create lower frequencies, the bass notes, do I want a long string or a short string? Well, I want a long string because I need this L to be large in order to get the frequency to be small. So that's why basses are longer than uh, violins. Something that's kind of fun, though this is not exam relevant, it's just some fun little fact that I think you guys might be interested in, is that this is actually not quite exactly how things work. So in reality, we still have the superposition principle. When I have a violin string, I'm going to excite the fundamental harmonic, so that'll be a big component of what I have going on, but I'm also going to excite a little bit of the second harmonic, and a little bit of the third harmonic. Maybe it's a little weaker, but there's a little third harmonic there, and so on. So the differences between instruments, what's called the timbre, actually is telling me how much is my fundamental harmonic, how much is my second harmonic, third harmonic, and so on. And so I've got this thing that I'm going to try to demonstrate here, perhaps successfully, perhaps I'll fail, to understand the difference between these. So here we have just a simple sine wave. Let's say it's the first harmonic of our system. Let me turn on the volume here and hopefully I can get this guy to work. All right, so that right there is what a single harmonic sounds like. It's pretty boring. And that doesn't sound like most of the instruments you're familiar with. It sounds like those weird, you know, electronic synthesizers. Now let's start to play around a little bit with what happens when I change my harmonic. So here, this is all first harmonic. If I just do second harmonic, it's at twice the frequency. So here is the first harmonic, and here's my second harmonic. What happens if I mix them a little together? Ah. So it mostly sounds like that lower harmonic, but it's got a little bit of an overtone. There's my third harmonic. Here's my fourth harmonic, fifth, sixth. I want you to close your eyes. Does that kind of sound a little like a trumpet? So this is my best attempt to mimic 
the harmonic series, the overtone series of a trumpet. They also have one in here to do violin. I don't think it's particularly good, but close your eyes. It sounds a little like a violin. And the important thing is it sounds nothing like that sinus line. All right? So kind of fun little fact musically is that what I'm doing when I actually have a different instrument is I'm exciting my overtone series differently and I'm getting a very different sound. So that's our little musical interlude here. It's not relevant for the exam, but it's actually very relevant to the superposition principle. I'm adding different harmonics together to get a result and standing waves. So these are standing waves that I'm excited. All right, back to the physics that is exam relevant. Currently we solve for standing waves where everything's held fixed at the end. But I've told you there's another important boundary condition where the ends are free. So when we come to an end that's free, it reflects without inverting. And what you can see here, if you look at this point right here, you see that that guy's gonna move up and down quite a bit as the string moves along. So I'm gonna simply tell you, if you have a free end, that's an antinode of the wave. So assume that a string of length L and both ends fixed has a fundamental frequency of 60 hertz. Let's go together and see what happens if I hold one end fixed and the other end free, an antinode. What is the fundamental frequency in that case? All right, so here I could do this with math. I would get the right answer. But actually what I'm gonna to advertise to you is that when it comes to standing waves like these, it's often very nice to not look at them in terms of math, but to simply try to draw them out. So let's go ahead and try to draw out what happens in this case. So if both ends are fixed, we know what that looks like. So this is the fundamental harmonic that we're asking about, the longest wavelength possible. And we know that at t equals zero, the wave function looks like this. At t equals to capital T over two, half of a period, it's fluctuated down to here. And then it oscillates back and forth between these two points. Notice that it's the longest wavelength possible. So I have no nodes in the middle and only nodes at the end. Now, let's say I have the exact same string exact same length, exact same everything, except this end is held free, meaning it's an antinode of the string. So what I want you to try to do, what I want you to try to do is try to draw out the largest wavelength sinusoid that has y equals zero here and y maximal at that first antinode. The answer is this. So it reaches its maximal right at that antinode. And then if you continued, it would go as such. It would hit that first node over here at 2L. So here's L between the zero and the maximum. Another L between zero, between the maximum back and zero again. And if I were to continue, so I'm going to continue. I'm going to zoom this guy out a little. So here was my node. Here's my first anti-node. It's going to hit another anti-node after another distance L. And finally, it'll come back to a node after another distance L. So if you imagine continuing past the wall, so if this distance is L, that happens three more times. And what that means is this wave function has a wavelength, node going to a maximum, coming through a minimum, going back to the same point of 4L. So if I had both, one end is a node, the other end is an antinode, 
my wavelength is 4L. If I come back to both ends fixed, meaning node, node, I could continue that wave, and I would see the wavelength is just 2 times L, which we know. We've solved that already. Okay, so if I draw this wave, one wavelength is 2 times L. So lambda, I'll call that node, node, is 2L. And lambda node antinode is 4L. In other words, the frequency, so the fundamental frequency with both of them nodes from earlier, was 60 hertz. And remember, the frequency is always velocity divided by lambda. So that means that the fundamental frequency with node antinode, so one end free and the other end held fixed, well, that's going to be velocity divided by lambda node antinode. This guy was v over 2L. This guy is v over 4L. So in other words, it's half the fundamental frequency of both ends held fixed. I have twice as long a wavelength when one end's held fixed and the other is not, so I have half the fundamental frequency. All right, so we did that part together. Now what I want you to try to do, and this will be the last part of this class uh, today, is I want you to figure out what happens if both ends are held free. So draw out what the wave function looks like, figure out the frequency, and tell me what is that fundamental frequency in hertz. Alrighty. So again, if in doubt, draw it out. I now have two ends held free. And what that means is that both of my walls are now antinodes. Or both of my ends are now antinodes. So that's the maximum of the sinusoidal function. And the longest wavelength thing that's going to fit in there and have an antinode at both ends will have a node right in the middle. Okay, so a maximum, zero, minimum. And if we continue that wave function, we see that the wavelength that comes back to itself at L plus L. So lambda of the fundamental note harmonic with two antinodes is 2L. And notice that's the same as with two nodes. So with two nodes, that fundamental harmonic was 2L. With two antinodes, it's actually the same. And so that means the fundamental frequency with two antinodes is actually the same as the fundamental frequency with two nodes. Or 60 hertz. All right. So that's the key thing that I wanted to emphasize with standing waves. The last thing that we will cover in the next class is sound waves. And so we'll see that this is particularly important when we talk about wind instruments, so sound waves in wind instruments, so, you know, tubas, trombones, trumpets, things like that. And with that, everyone have a nice couple of days, and we will talk for our last class on Thursday. Thanks. Stay safe.